Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are a great and awesome God, Lord, and we are so, um, so thankful for your love and your grace in our lives, Father, for your mercies that are new every morning. Father, we're also thankful, most thankful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on a cross, Lord, that we could be uh, reconciled to you, a holy God. And so, Father, tonight we offer ourselves in this time we have um, to you and ask, Lord, that you, by your spirit, would speak to our hearts and our minds through your word, Lord God. Um, we do um, praise you and look forward to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, last week, uh, or no, th- it's been two weeks, three weeks, wow. Golly, that's a long time. Has it really been three weeks? Yeah, two two weeks. It's only been, well, anyways, it's been a while since we were together. Let's start over. <laughs> this is, uh, so we are now in uh, Second Chronicles. Um, for those of you who've been attending on Sunday nights for a time, this is our last book um, of the Bible to go through together. And we will have on Sunday nights completed um, the full, um, every book of the Bible. It would be an awesome celebration um, when we get through these next, uh, or the remainder of this book. So it's very exciting. Fred, um, some time ago, whether it was a week or two weeks ago, it wasn't last Sunday, but I think the Sunday before, Fred started uh, Second Chronicles, um, and we did chapter 1 together. The book of Chronicles, as Fred pointed out um, the last time we were together, is a book that was actually one book in the Jewish um, Bible. And so First and Second Chronicles were combined. And in our Bibles today, it is two, two books. And so it separates it a little bit. And the first, uh, first book of um, Chronicles um, is uh, largely about the nation, of Israel, or the nation of Judah up and in through King David. The second book now starts in, uh, in King Solomon, and the first nine chapters, more or less, are about King Solomon's reign. And then from there forward to the end of the book, we will see the, um, the remainder of the kingdoms or the kings and their, um, their rule of the nation of Judah. Second, or first and Second Chronicles deal primarily and almost exclusively with the, the southern kingdom of Judah. That is to say that there is not much or uh, very little reference to the northern kingdom of Israel. And there's good reason for that. The northern kingdom of Israel, as we know from our studies in First and Second Kings, had uh, numerous kings and none of which were godly kings. Um, and whereas in the southern kingdom uh, of Judah, this again all is after the separation that occurred after Solomon's death, um, the southern kingdom of Judah um, had... I believe it was 20 kings, eight of which were counted as godly, or at least mostly godly kings. Um, so this, this book in, the, um, in Chronicles was written after the, uh, or it's a post-exilic book, so it was written after they were exiled to Babylon, um, and uh, probably written by Ezra uh, to the people that were in captivity. And it is, um, in large part, while a chron- chronology, it is also instructive for them and an encouragement that even um, under discipline, God can raise up um, godly people and uh, has a plan for, and as we'll see in chapter 7, I believe it is, perhaps it's, uh, yeah, I think it's chapter 7, we'll see that God does have a plan for his people and it is a plan to bless him and encourage him and uh, to restore him to their land. So, again, the first, um, first book of Chronicles dealt largely with um, uh, Judah and the kingdom under David, and now the book, second book of Chronicles deals with Solomon to start with and then the rest of the, um, the kings. And so, with that uh, review, let's get started in um, Second Chronicles chapter 1. And here it is said that um, the, then Solomon determined to build a temple for the name of the Lord, and a royal house for himself. Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. And so here you are, um, you see, you know, Solomon's um, uh, desire and his determination to build God a temple. If you recall, um, Solomon, um, or King David, had that desire in his heart to build the temple, 
but God uh, refused to allow him to do it because he was a man of war. He was a warrior. And um, rather, God provided that um, he would have a son, and his son would be the one that would build the temple for God there in Jerusalem, and Solomon being that son. And in the first chapter, we saw, too, that God had blessed Solomon with great wisdom and great understanding uh, based on Solomon's request that um, that's what he would receive. And because of that, uh, his Solomon's heart and his request to receive wisdom and understanding rather than great riches or um, the death of his enemies, God also blessed him with um, great financial resources to the point where Solomon was one of the wealthiest men that ever lived. Um, but he was given this uh, by his father, a desire to build the temple. David, as we have seen in First uh, Chronicles and elsewhere in First Kings, um, David had stored up and essentially provisioned much of the, the uh, materials that would be needed to build the, um, build the temple, but it was Solomon now who was going to execute it, uh, the construction and the implementation of David's plans. So there in, in, here in chapter 2, verse 1, you know, it says that Solomon determined to build a temple for the name of the Lord. Notice that it, it does say that it was for the name of the Lord. We're going to go through it, of course, um, tonight, and we'll see it again as we continue through the book for a little bit. Um, but it was for the name of the Lord. And the temple, um, we have in America here, in our culture, we have a tendency to think of churches as um, an equivalent of the temple. But it was really quite different. Um, the temple was never set up as a place of congregation, right? Rather, it was a, t uh, it was a place to offer sacrifices to again, receive a covering for one's sin. It was never a place for congregating. In fact, we're going to see tonight that the temple was only 2,700 square feet in size, uh, 30 by 90. That's about one-third the size of this building, right? So it was relatively small, and yet it was a very um, majestic um, structure as Solomon built it, but it was for the purpose of coming and for the glory of uh, the Lord, right? For the name of the Lord, where people would come and they would make their sacrifices and be reconciled to, um, to their God. And so he, um, he points that out right away here in chapter or verse one, for it was uh, build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal house for himself being Solomon. Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear those burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone, um, in the mountains and 3,600 to oversee them. Then Solomon sent to Hiram, king of Tyre, saying, as you, dealt, as you have dealt with, my, or with David, my father, and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense for the continual, uh, continual showbread, for the burnt offerings morning and evening, on the Sabbath, on the new moon, and on the set feast of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. So while David, um, David had um, accumulated much of the resources um, to build this temple, there were still some that were remaining. And so Solomon here petitions the king of Tyre, which is Hiram, um, to, for additional um, Resources, and you're going to see here in the next couple of verses that he also asked for workmen. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that was his relationship that they had with Tyre and Sidon, the king there. Um, and it was a cooperative relationship, one that David had initiated and one that David had nurtured. And now Solomon comes and he impresses upon Tyre, as you were with my father David, please be with me and help me to build this house for my God, right? The, the Lord. And he says, I am building there, I believe it is a um, oh, better part of verse 4. It says, I am building a temple for, again, for the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbath, on the new moons, and on the set feasts. So that was the function and the purpose of the, of the temple. And uh, that was not only David's heart, but Solomon's heart. In verse 5, it says, Then the temple which I build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. But who is able to build him a temple, since heaven and the heavens of heavens, or excuse me, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I then, 
that I should build him a temple accepted to burn sacrifice before him. So here in verse 5 and 6, David, um, or excuse me, Solomon makes just a great proclamation of, of who our God is. He says, I, and the temple which I will build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. And that is true. A truer statement may never have been made. The God we serve is the king of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that's within them. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and not only the cattle, but he owns the hills too, right? He is God Almighty, and Solomon here recognizes that, and he recognizes that he's greater than all other gods, and that being a, the, the second one being with a little g. And we will see um, as we go through Second Chronicles, after the reign of Solomon, that and even uh, the, essentially the remainder of Solomon's life, this is kind of the pinnacle of it right here, where we are in the pinnacle of his reign, but we will see that the nation of Judah slips into idolatry and serving um, gods, idols, little g gods. And here Solomon acknowledges and proclaims to Tyre, who is a Gentile, uh, the king of Tyre, Hiram, who is a Gentile, that in fact our God is the greatest God, greater than all other gods. And it is... Um, as a nation, that was the pinnacle under David's leadership when he was king and now under King Solomon. You know, great wealth, peace. God had blessed Solomon's uh, reign with peace and prosperity. And then it starts to crumble. And it crumbles because the people seek after idols, little gods. Yet Solomon here recognizes who our God is and he is greater than all of God. Um, if we learn nothing else tonight, we should take that away. If you got a pencil or um, a pen, highlight that verse. Um, if you don't like to highlight in your um, in your Bible or write in your Bible, write it on your hand. Our God is greater than all other gods, and it is a true statement, um, even today. Solomon reigned um, about 960 B.C., 960 years before Christ. This is 2022, so that makes it 2,982 years ago, more or less. For 3,000 years, it, this statement has been true, and it will continue to be true for another 3,000 years if God tarries. Um, and again, uh, at the end of that, um, those two verses, he says, except to, the only reason I am able to build it, um, who am I? Solomon, you know, in a moment of humility, says, who am I to build it since the heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain him? And it is true, our God is um, immeasurable. He is that, that large and he is that great except um, that I should build him a temple to burn sacrifice before him. Verse 7, it says, Therefore send me a, at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver and bronze and iron and purple and crimson and blue who has skill to engrave with the skillful men who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem whom David my father provided. Also send me cedar and cypress and algum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants have skill to cut timber in Lebanon, and indeed my servants will be with your servants to prepare timber for me in abundance. For the temple which I am about to build shall be great and wonderful. And indeed I will give to your servants, uh, um, excuse me, I will give to your servants the woodsmen who cut timber, 20,000 cores of ground wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine and 20,000 baths of oil. So here, um, Solomon makes the plea to the king of Tyre and asks him to send a, a skillful man. Now this man is uh, not a union worker, apparently, because he is qualified in not only uh, skillful in the work of gold and silver, but also bronze and, and iron, and, and purple and crimson um, and blue, who has skill to engrave with the skillful men, right? He... This is a, a true craftsman, one who could do all of these things um, that uh, Solomon is looking for. And then he, he promises there in verse 10, he says, and indeed I will give to your servants the woodsmen who cut these timbers and these logs for us. I will give him all of this, the ground wheat, the barley, the olive oil, and the wine. And uh, it is uh, you know, a tremendous sum of what Solomon was going to uh, pay them for and how he was going to go about doing it. 
again, Israel being, and Judah in particular, being a very um, agriculturally oriented and kind of a breadbasket um, of, of sorts for that area in the Middle East and continues to be that way today. Um, he had those resources. And again, um, they had been very, the nation had been very productive under David and now under Solomon's reign. And so he asked for that man, therefore send him at once. Then in uh, verse 11, we find Hiram's response. It says, um, the king of Tyre answered in, in writing, which he sent to Solomon, because the Lord, your, the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Hiram also said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who, who made heaven and earth, for he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal house for himself. This is a, a fascinating uh, verse in the sense that, again, Hiram is a, um, he's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. And so, but he's been exposed to the Jewish religion for years, being neighbors there in Tyre and Lebanon, um, Sidon, and being a, a friend or at least an acquainted with David. Um, he was, uh, he had seen the, uh, God's influence on the Jewish people, and, and as a result, he was, um, he was familiar with it, but he recognized who um, the Lord God of Israel was, who made heaven and earth. One of the great things I, th I think that so many people in our culture today do not understand or at least appreciate is that God not only designed it, but he created it and he made it. And God, when the scripture says that in the beginning, actually it's in John um, chapter 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and and he created the heavens and the earth, right? And Jesus Christ is that word. Jesus Christ is, was there with the Father, and, and they created it. They designed it. From the, the coarsest to the uh, most minute details in our lives and anything that we can perceive, when you look at it, we need to understand and recognize that God created it. God, God designed it to work like it does, and God um, created it, and he built it that word create in the uh, original Hebrew was a work of bar, or the word bara, and that is to create out of nothing, right? He created it from nothing. He spoke it into existing, the scriptures tell us. Yet this Hiram, who is a Gentile, recognized that, that he was the creator of the heaven and made heaven and earth. If the people in America in 2022 would recognize who God is and that he was the creator of heaven and earth, we would, have, we would live in an entirely different culture, right? But and yet, we want to uh, um, give credit to some evolutionary process, um, which is not science at all, although scientists or many scientists would proclaim it to be, it's not. Um, Sue, my wife, as you, some of you know, is a beekeeper, and she was at the Nevada State Beekeepers Conference this weekend, uh, this weekend in... Um, in Yarrington, um, and there was a professor from Auburn University who came and spoke, and very knowledgeable about bees, and that's what he studies, is uh, just, he's an entomologist, and he studies bees, and he talks about how they build their comb, and how it's perfectly shaped, right? I mean, it's a hexagonal shape, and it perfectly fits together. These bees, you know, when they give, you give them a space and a hive, they, they build this wax comb that they can store their honey in, and he goes on and on, and he According to Sue, I mean, he was a fascinating speaker and very knowledgeable. And then at the very end, and he says it took millions and billions of years for them to evolve to get to there. It's like, oh, you just lost all your credibility, right? You know, no, no, God created them. And he did so from the foundation of the earth, right? He knew exactly what they would be doing. And so I'm totally impressed that Hiram recognizes that and proclaims it. Oh, that we would all proclaim that God was the designer and creator of the heavens and the earth and all that's within them. Um, every chance we get to uh, point people to that fact. He continues and he says um, there in verse 13, he says, now I have sent a skillful man endowed with understanding, Hurum, not Hiram, Hurum, H-U-R-A-M, my master craftsman, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, stone and wood, purple and blue, fine linen, 
and crimson and to make any engraving and to accomplish any plan which may be given to him with your skillful men and with the skillful men of my Lord David, your father. Now, therefore, the wheat, the barley, the oil, and the wine which my Lord has spoken of, let him send to his servants. And we will cut wood from Lebanon as much as you need. We will bring it to you in rafts by the sea to Joppa, and you will carry it up to Jerusalem. Joppa um, is today modern-day Tel Aviv. And it's a coastal city, um, so it was easy for him to come out of Tyre there and, and just bring it south to uh, Joppa where they could pick it up and haul it up the hill to Jerusalem. But notice he speaks of Hiram, this master craftsman. Again, not a union guy. Um, but he was skilled in all these things. But in this, my reading of the, or the, excuse me, my Bible, the New King James Version, it, it says in parent, parenthetically that he was the son of the woman of the, of the daughters of Dan. So he was, his mother was a Jewess, right? Um, and so, and his father, though, was a man of Tyre. So he was a Gentile. So a Jewish, a Jew, Jewish woman and a Gentile got together and they had their son, Huram, who then was used by God um, at the instructions of uh, the uh, king of Tyre to be used of God to work on the temple. It is a fascinating thing, and I do not believe it is coincidental, that God would use a Jew and a Gentile to help and craft the things of the temple right? It is going to be a Jewish temple, no doubt. But the hands of the Gentiles are going to be in it from the beginning. And that, to me, speaks volumes of what God's plan was, is to ultimately, that it wasn't, he wasn't just the God of the Jews. He was the God of all people. And it is interesting that here, the master craftsman that Hiram sends to him, a young man by the name of Hiram, is, in fact, Jew, has, is both Jew and Gentile. Um, that is an interesting fact. Continuing on, it says there in verse 17, Then Solomon numbered um, all the aliens who were in the land of Israel after the census in which David his father had numbered them, and there were found to be 153,600. And, and he made 70,000 of them bearers of burdens, 80,000 stone cutters in the mountain, and 3,600 overseers to make the people work. That is precisely the same number that he said there in uh, verse 1 and 2, right? That Solomon um, selected 70,000 men to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. So that's a, what, it's 153,600 people to, to work um, on the temple and together in their collective efforts. Wearsby notes that this... Uh, Solomon's, um, Solomon's use of these people was resented by the people. Um, that there was a, a faction of people within the nation of Israel that actually resented that he would bring these people together to work on it, on the temple. And it would be this underlying bitterness that would ultimately um, contribute to the division of the nation of Israel when um, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, takes over. Right, And it, if you remember, and we will see it again um, in this book, but you would likely remember that Rehoboam, when he became king, he, um, he went to the elders and he asked, and he said, you know, how should I, um, how should I conduct the people? His, his father had been um, one who levied heavy taxes. I mean, he had to build the temple, and it was, as we saw a little bit last time we were together under um, Fred's, discussion, you know, he had horses and chariots and he had an army and he had all of this stuff and um, there, you know, you got to tax the people to have that and so he put this heavy burden on him and ultimately um, Rehoboam took the advice of his friends and uh, rather than the elders who said, you know, take it easy on him, he took the advice of his friends and he even levied heavier taxes which uh, further divided the nation, the, the combined 12 tribes into um, 10 and 2. Um, so anyways, it's interesting to me that, um, you know, Wearsby notes that, you know, this is kind of the subtle part of this, that it just, that uh, current starts running um, at this time. I'm going to try to get through th uh, chapter three, um, and I want to come back and make a significant point about um, this temple.
and how it relates in application of the temple. I, I said verse 3, I meant chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, and he began to build on the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. So in chapter 2, verse 1, we saw that he determined in his mind to do it. And in chapter 3, he began to build it. That is a big difference. When you determine in your mind to do something, um, my example, a diet, right? Uh, and you determine in your mind, uh, I've been determined in my mind now for months to start a diet. But getting from that point where I determine in my mind to when I do it and actually do it consistently, there's a, there's a big gap. And it could have been that way with Solomon, but he did. He determined in his mind in chapter 2 to do it, and he began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem at Mount Moriah. Um, again, it says there in the, uh, on the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. It's interesting to me, it took him four years. So I still got some time on my diet, right? <laughs> I, um, I've got a little time yet. But notice that it's out in Mount Moriah. At the, and it, um, the writer here in Chronicles points out that it was the threshing floor of Ornan. And if you remember, David, at the time he created the census, and he did so foolishly, and God came to him and he gave him those, you know, those three choices, and he ultimately selected the plague. Um, but to stop the plague, he ultimately went to Ornan, a Jebusite, again, a, um, a Gentile, but had been living in the city of Jerusalem, a Jebusite who had occupied it. He went to him, and he, he wanted to buy the floor of Ornan, and Ornan uh, recognized David as king and said, oh, no, you, you can have it. And David said, I will not. I will not sacrifice to the Lord unless it costs me something, right? This is that, this is that location, Mount Moriah, where they're going to build the temple. This is also that same location that Abraham and Isaac together went up on the hill, up onto Mount Moriah, where they were going to um, offer the sacrifice, except for they didn't have a lamb. You remember? And Abraham instructed his son and said, God will provide the lamb. You know, foretelling of our great sacrifice and our king, Jesus Christ, and, and his sacrifice on a cross, which coincidentally is at Golgotha on the top of Mount Moriah, um, is where Jesus Christ ultimately was crucified, our Savior. Fascinating, isn't it? That that would be the place that God, after... Um, after Abraham and Isaac and after um, David going to Ornan and buying the place, and then we see here, this is where Solomon builds the temple, where these sacrifices would be made to reconcile the people to, the holy, to a holy God, and then ultimately that Jesus Christ the, would die on a cross there for the salvation, and excuse me, for the, the perpetuation of our sins, right? For all of mankind. That by simply accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we can be reconciled to a holy God. He who created the heavens and the earth and all that's within them. He that is the greatest of all gods, right? That we could have that place, and it was at this very place on Mount Moriah that Solomon is going to build this temple. There are no coincidences in God's kingdom, right? These things were ordained from the foundation of the earth. Verse 3, it says, This foundation which Solomon laid for the building of the house, the length was 60 cubits, um, the cubit according to the former measure, and the width was 20 cubits, and the vestibule that was in front of the sanctuary was 20 cubits long across the width of the house, and the height was 120. Okay? So this is a, a cubit, it's about 18 inches. So the width of the, uh, or the length was 60 cubits, making it 90 feet. Um, the width was 20 cubits, which makes it 30 feet. And its height was 120 cubits, um, which 120 times 1.5 is 180. Um, that can't be right. The height was 120 um, cubits. Never mind that part. <laughs> it was 90 by 30 by 30 feet high, I believe, is how, uh, how, um, tall, or how tall it was. At any rate, um, 90 by 30, 2,700 square feet is a, not a very big um, 
area as we point out. But again, it was not the purpose of the temple to be a place of congregation like we have and we know our churches to be. He continues in verse 5. He says, He overlaid the inside with pure gold. The larger room he paneled with cypress, which is overlaid with fine gold, and he carved palm trees and chain work on it. And he decorated the house with precious stones for beauty, and the gold was the gold of Parvain. He also overlaid the house, the beams, and the doorposts, its walls and doors with gold. And he carved cherubim on the walls. And he made the most holy place. Its length was according to the width of the house, 20 cubits, and its width, uh, 20 cubits. And he overlaid it with 600 talents of fine gold. The weight of the nails was 50 shekels. So much like the tabernacle in the wilderness that Moses established, there were three compartments to, um, to the, uh, the temple. Um, there was the outer court and the courtyard. There was the holy place, which was inside. And then there was the holy of holies. Um, here Solomon gives us the dimensions of the temple. Um, and the courtyard was a, a, a portion. Um, again, the um, holy place was, excuse me, the courtyard was a place that was visible to all people. It was outside. You could see it. You and I, as we would approach the temple, or we could see that part. That would be the courtyard. The holy place was inside that. And that holy place was a place where the priests, um, actually where the altar was, and the priests would place the, uh, the sacrificed animal on the altar for it to be consumed, you know, and as, as a burnt offering. Um, and then the holy of holies was separated from the holy place by a curtain, as we know. And that the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant of God existed. And as we've seen here, it was overlaid in pure gold. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, pure gold um, of Parvain, as it turns out. And so that is, um, that is kind of the structure of it. And he says that it was overlaid by 600 talents of fine gold. 600 talents of fine gold is um, about 21.6 tons of gold. 21.6 tons of gold is, um, in today's dollars, uh, would be about $1 billion worth of gold. You wonder why Nebuchadnezzar and his men were so excited when they finally came and they ransacked um, the temple in his third, um, his third siege of the city, and they ransacked the temple. Um, there was 21 over 21 tons of gold that they would carry back to Babylon that uh, had been uh, destroyed when he uh, destroyed the city. The nails here, the weight of the nails, it says, was 50 shekels. Well, 50 shekels is approximately 1.25 pounds. In today's price of gold, that would be approximately $28,000 per nail. Now, we have a little inflation in the United States right now, but nails do not yet cost $28,000 a piece. So... Um, Anyways, uh, it's is fascinating, uh, you know, that he would put um, this much um, into it, and it was a great, glorious inside. It's interesting, though, that the outside was rather, relatively common, right? The inside was beautiful. The inside was magnificent. It was incredible, just pure gold. And the Holy of Holies there, and the holy place was, was beautiful, and I think it speaks a lot, and, well, I'm going to come back to it. Just keep that in mind as, I, as we close out this, the service here in a little bit. Verse 10, it says, In the most holy place he made two cherubim, fashioned by carving, and overlaid them with gold. The wings of the cherubim were 20 cubits in overall length. One wing of the cherub was five uh, cubits touching the wall of the room, and the other wing was five cubits touching the wing of the other cherub. One wing of the other cherub was five cubits touching the wall of the rooms, and the other wing also was five cubits touching the wing of the other cherub. The wings of these cherubs spanned 20 cubits overall. They stood on their feet, and they faced inward. And he made the veil of blue, purple, crimson, and fine linen and wove cherubim into it. So inside this, the Holy of Holies, there were these two big cherub, um, right? And they were huge uh, cherub, covered with gold, of course, um, as everything was inside the Holy of Holies. And um, they spread from one side to the other, this cherub touching each other and facing inward towards um, the Holy of Holies, which was the presence and represented the presence of God. 
he um, noticed that the, um, it says there in verse 14, and he made the veil of blue, purple, crimson, and fine linen and wove cherubim into it. This was the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Now the holy of place, you know, we had the outer courtyard, which is visible to everybody, the holy place, which was visible only to the priest, and then the holy of holies, which is only visible to the high priest, and that only on one day per year, which is the Day of Atonement. So um, that veil, though, was the separation. And notice that it was the, had four colors in it, blue, purple, crimson, and fine linen. Okay, The blue representing heaven, right? All of these things, every furnishing within, um, inside the temple um, pointed to God, right? Blue being the color of heaven, purple being royalty, right? The color of royalty, crimson being that uh, which covers the blood that would be necessary to cover our sins that we could be reconciled to a holy God, representing that sacrifice. And then the fine linen speaking to holiness, right? All of these is all... All of it is, everything inside the temple points to God and points to Jesus Christ. He continues there and he says in verse 15, he says, also he made in front of the temple two pillars, 35 cubits high, and the capital that was on top of each of them was five cubits. He made wreaths of chain work and in, as in this intersectory and put them on top of the pillars and he made 100 pomegranates and put them on the wreaths of chain work. Then he set up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left. He called the name on, of the one on the right hand, Jachin, and the name of the one on the left, Boaz. So here we have outside the temple, in front of the temple, two pillars, 35 feet high, which is 52 and a half, or excuse me, 35 cubits high, which would be 52 and a half feet. And then the capital, the ornamental thing that was on top of the, uh, the column, uh, was five cubits in, in height. That would be seven and a half feet. So the, the top of those two pillars would be about 60 feet above the courtyard and the entrance to it. That um, the, um, the name of those, they called the one, uh, let me get to my point in my notes. They called the one um, Jachin. And Jachin is said to, or it means he, he shall establish, and Boaz being the second one, in his strength. So they, they named the two of them, that he shall establish, and in his strength were, um, were there. So it's fascinating, this, uh, uh, um, the temple, and uh, Solomon's, um, the detail and the work that went into, and the, the number of people who contributed to Constructing Solomon's Temple. Just a fascinating um, uh, introduction to it. The application, though, I think is even greater, right? If you were going to entitle this service uh, or this, uh, this study, you might say, uh, you might entitle it, You Are the Temple of the Living God, right? And then it is true in... Um, there's several places in the New Testament, right, that it speaks to um, that very fact. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul writing to the Corinthian, the Christians at Corinth said, Do you not know that you are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we are God... Um, excuse me, under uh, the new covenant and the covenant of Jesus Christ, we are the temple of the living God. There's not a temple that exists, obviously, at, at this particular time. Um, Solomon's temple was um, ultimately destroyed by the Babylonians. Zerubbabel's temple was ultimately uh, destroyed. King Herod built a, a temple to satisfy the Jews. That was ultimately destroyed by Titus in AD 90. Uh, there is no temple today. We do anticipate another temple coming um, at some point, but that temple will be um, essentially constructed by, or at least under the uh, um, authority of the Antichrist. Um, and then ultimately he will walk into the temple there and proclaim himself God and uh, be the abomination of desolation that starts the last three and a half years of Revelation. But there is no temple today. You are the temple of the living God. 
And that is, a, that is a great thing that Paul points out to the Corinthians as he's ministering to them there. He says later in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, he says, Or do you not know that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. You belong to God. So in this, um, and I give much credit to John Corson, he sees in this, uh, starting in chapter 2, where it speaks of um, the, the number of people that were necessary to, to build the temple. Recall that uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, it said there were 70,000 um, bearers of burdens, right? And there were 80,000 that would quarry stone and 3,600 3, that would oversee them. If the temple is, and if we are um, the temple of God, consider, well, actually there's three applications, really, of uh, the temple. There's the body of Christ, right? The body of an individual believer, which Paul, in, in, in these verses I just read, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians and chapter 6, confirms that we are, the, uh, as individual believers, the, uh, the temple of the living God. And then the body of believers corporately is called the temple of God, right? So there are three, really. The body of Christ, the body of an individual, and the body of believers as a, corporately as a whole. So John Corson, um, again, um, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, acknowledges that these, um, these 70,000 burden bearers would be like prayer warriors, Right? corporately in the body of Christ. Those are those who are just prayer warriors, people who give themselves to praying for the needs of the body of Christ and the people of them. We have a great prayer chain here. And um, it is uh, it's fascinating to me. I've only been on the prayer chain for a very short period of time, but it's fascinating to me the number of needs that are there and presented. I encourage you all to you know, volunteer to be on that and um, faithfully pray for those needs. There are many needs in our body, let alone nationally, let alone internationally, particularly what's going on in Ukraine right now. We have a tremendous need for prayer warriors. He then, those that would be carved stones, those 80,000 people that, um, that God set up through Solomon's wisdom to be carving those stones. And they, these were huge stones, huge, massive stones that they would carve. Corson acknowledges and, and suggests that those are the ones that would be makers of disciples, right? Those would be Sunday school teachers, nursery workers, those that would um, lead Bible studies. Those would be the carvers of stone, in the, those that would be structuring um, and building and working towards the temple. And then you, you see that you have these overseers, the 3,600 overseers over the 150,000 workers, and those would be those who are given to a ministry, a ministry of leadership, right? And so you can see, um, you know, how you, that application is even applicable to the church today. It gets, it gets better, though, or it gets even uh, more refined as we, we look now at the temple and its structure as Solomon, or Solomon laid it out in chapter 3. You know, we have those three areas. We have the courtyard, we have the holy place, and we have the holy of holies. If we are truly a temple of the living God um, and God resides in us, we, we too are um, structured in that fashion. In fact, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, right? We are th three or one, right? That's the way God, we know that uh, intuitively. That we, Again, we have a physical body. We have a soul, which speaks to, you know, the, um, our... Um, uh, our emotions, our mind, our thoughts, and of course our spirit, which um, ultimately as a Christian belongs to God. So in this courtyard, which again, much like um, um, is, was visible, the courtyard of the temple was visible to everyone, your body is seen by everyone, right? It's easy, you, we can visualize you know, and see each other uh, based on our eyesight. We see each other. That is like being in the courtyard. And then you take uh, to the next our, our step, our soul, is that is, again, your mind and your emotions and so forth. 
that is revealed only to a few people, right? There's not many that know your, your intimate thoughts and um, those that would be close to you and you might share those with. That is your soul. And that is like the Holy of Holies, or not the Holy of Holies, but rather the holy place. The courtyard being where everybody sees it, the holy place where only the priest sees it, right? Only there to um, offer those sacrifices on the, on the altar. And so that is um, equivalent of our soul. And it's, uh, again, only revealed to a few people, um, and it is equivalent of the holy place. And, the, and then finally there is the spirit, our spirits, again, that is likened in the temple to the Holy of Holies. And it is only you and God that know your spirit, right? I can't judge your spirit. I can't tell if you're saved. As You know, people will ask me sometimes at the death of someone, uh, do you think they were saved? I don't know. That's, that's between them and God. Only God knows that because that is their spirit that he's dealing with. But that is likened to the Holy of Holies, right? It's just you and God. Now, you only have access to the Holy of Holies because of the work on a cross that Jesus Christ did some 2,000 years ago, dying on a cross that we could be saved. Where at his death, the, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. That we no longer needed someone to intercede for us. We no longer needed that priest to go to God for us. We just, we had the ability and the privilege and the honor to go direct to God by prayer in our spirit to speak to him directly, to take our petitions directly to him. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. The Old Testament, the beautiful part about the Old Testament, and I've said it many times now as we've gone through it together, is it was given to us as examples. The writer of Hebrews tells us that it was given to us as an example. These things were written as examples from, for us. Solomon's description of the temple is a beautiful, fascinating thing, and it's amazing to go through the numbers and figure out what it might have cost, but the more beautiful thing is how it relates to your life and my life and our relationship to God. And so it is a, it's a fascinating thing, and it's so easy just to read through it and uh, move on, right? Where's the next exciting thing in the Bible? There can be nothing more exciting than to realize that the temple of God was structured just as your relationship with God is. And I think that's in the last, perhaps, part of this application is where are you at in that progress? Are you in the out, outer court watching from a distance? Right? Have you given your life to Christ and now you're, you're in the service of Christ and the church and the people of God you're working to serve them so you're in that, that place of the the holy place, right? Where you're being of service. You're actually much like the priests were. You were busy and you're active. Or are you in your personal walk? Are you residing within the holy of holies? You and God having that intimate fellowship that's only possible by the work of Christ on a cross. I think that's a challenge to each of us as to where we are with Christ, where we are with God. With that, I'll close. We don't... We don't have a song tonight, so if you'd bow your um, hearts with me, we'd close it in, uh, in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we, we do love you and um, praise you. Um, we're just truly, Lord, in awe of you and all that you have done and all that you are doing in our lives, Lord. Father, for your word and, Lord, how it is just that a great example to us. And as we pull these, um, these things out of your word and we can see the, the applications Father, um, it's just awesome, Lord, to see that the Gentiles, one who has not given himself, and Hiram specifically, Lord, to given himself, but he, uh, to a study perhaps of your law, Lord, yet he recognized who you are, Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords, creator of the heavens and earth. In Solomon's acknowledgement tonight, Lord, that you, know, you are the greatest God. There is no God besides you. Lord, we too, Proclaim those things with our mind, with our heart, and with our lips, Lord. Um, we are just truly in awe of you. Father, I thank you for the examples within your word tonight, Lord, the temple being that, that great example for us. Lord, I ask that you would write these things upon our hearts and minds. And Lord, as you do, that we would be 
um, equipped, Father. We'd be encouraged and quickened by your spirit, Lord God, to be faithful, to be good witnesses of all that you are doing in our lives individually and help us to be about your work that you've called us to do. Lord, I thank you for these people that have given of their time. I pray, Lord, you'd go before them this week. Father, that you would open their eyes to see the needs around them, Lord, and that as you do, and Father, that you would also give them a spirit of boldness and just a confirmation as only your spirit can give of the, the truths that we know and we hold dear, that they would be ready in season and out of season to give an account of the faith that they have. Lord, we do love you. And Father, tonight our hearts are heavy for our Christian brothers and sisters in Ukraine, Lord, who are under attack. Lord, we pray for them. I pray for the pastors and the, the leaders, Father, for the servants that are there. And ask, Lord God, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them. And Lord, by their witness and their faithful service to you, Lord God, that many in this difficult time might be saved. Lord, that might come to know your son, Jesus Christ, as a, their personal savior. Lord, that you would have your perfect will in that situation too. Lord, we do love you. We know that you're in control of all things. And Father, we just give you our lives again tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. <laughs>